Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ASA web seminar, Understanding Home Health versus Home Care, which is part of the Family Caregiver Support Series sponsored by Home Instead. The next presentation in this series is on August 5th, and you can visit our website at www.asaging.org for more information. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen marked Resources. Under the tab marked CE application here, you'll find information on how to obtain CE credit for today's event. You have 60 days to complete a continuing education application for this webinar, and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application in order for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are logged in directly to this, if you are not logged in directly to this webinar, that is, if you are watching as part of a group and did not log in using an individual confirmation URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way to track your online attendance. If you'd like to receive continuing education credit, please be sure you log in using a confirmation URL you received while individually registering. If you have questions during the presentation, you can send those at any time using the questions box, and we'll save those for the last 15 minutes of the program. And now I'd like to welcome today's presenters. Lakeland Hogan is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care and a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska Omaha studying social gerontology. Lanita Kanoki is a registered nurse with a Bachelor of Science degree in business management from Bellevue University. She also holds the distinction of certified managed care nurse and fellow in readmission prevention. Lanita is responsible for the healthcare integration strategy for the Home Instead Senior Care's global network, which includes a focus on care transitions, pro care transitions programs and cl clinical integration. Her emphasis is for the Home Instead franchise network to work fluidly with the medical community and remain the global thought leaders for home care. She is a previous president for the American Association of Managed Care Nurses and currently serves on their executive leadership board. She was awarded the 2012 Managed Care Nurse Leader of the Year for her collaboration with care managers and discharge, discharge planners in the care transitions arena. Welcome, Lakeland and Lanita. Thank you so much, Betsy. Hello, everyone. So glad that you've taken time out of your busy days to join us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about home health versus home care. And these are two types of care that often get confused. Uh, many older adults, they prefer to age in place and return home after a hospital or rehabilitation stay, but often assistance is necessary during that transition. So when considering help in the home, many older adults do not understand the types of care that are available and the benefits of these types of services. Older adults, family caregivers, and even sometimes professionals commonly recognize the term home health, but they might not fully understand how these services differ from home care. Confusion happens because the two are often grouped together, but it's really important to consider the differences. They are complementary to one another, home health and home care, but there are significant differences. And both services can help older adults achieve their goal of remaining at home, aging in place, and, and care, uh, successfully transitioning home. Uh, so my hope today is that by the end of this webinar, you'll better be able to understand the differences between the two types of care, home health and home care, uh, as professionals in the aging field, and, and be better uh, equipped to explain the differences to the older adults and family caregivers that you work with. So before I get too much farther into the presentation, I do want to go through our objectives quick with you. I'm first going to start with a discussion around the importance of care at home. Uh, especially with COVID-19, there has been a bigger emphasis placed on the home for older adults as a safe environment. Uh, and so uh, we're going to review why home um, is so important for older adults. And then I'm going to cover both types of services. So I'll start with home health care services and then also discuss home care services. I'll talk about uh, the types of care involved, uh, the benefits, also the types of payment uh, for each. And then I'm going to uh, hand it over to Lanita, who really is an expert in the transition home and how these types of care can really help an older adult successfully transition and reduce the chance of readmissions. And then I'm uh, we're always wanting to leave you with 
uh, resources to support you in the work that you do. Uh, so we'll cover those at the very end. So let's talk a little bit more about the importance of care at home. As I just mentioned, COVID-19 has really placed an emphasis on home, especially for those who are vulnerable, including older adults. Before COVID, uh, 9 out of 10 older adults age 65 and older reported that they hoped to remain at home. That's where they preferred to age. And while the home is in a desirable environment, the reality is that about 70% of those age 65 and older, they're going to need assistance at some point, and then 20% will need care for longer than five years. So if an older adult wants to remain at home, it's really important to have conversations with the older adult and the family to discuss options around care at home in order to help make their wishes a reality, help them to age in place successfully. Uh, you know, this discussion, uh, the, the responsibility of care usually falls to family caregivers. Uh, so will there be family available to assist or will they need to bring in outside help such as home health or home care? Uh, so we want to be able to educate older adults about uh, the type of care that's available at home, the type of support. But we also know that nearly one in five seniors that are discharged from a hospital will be readmitted within the first 30 days due oftentimes to preventable factors. So having support at home can be even more critical for those who have been hospitalized or are transitioning home from a reha rehabilitation stay. And because of COVID-19, it's really important to try to keep older adults out of the hospital uh, for preventable reasons uh, to reduce their risk of possible exposure to COVID-19 and other uh, infectious diseases. So uh, what makes care at home so confusing for the general public and sometimes even for uh, professionals in the aging space? And from my perspective, Lenita and I were discussing, you know, there's a lot of confusion on what do we call it? Home care and home health care uh, have been called a lot of things over the years. So sometimes people will refer uh, to visiting nurses. They might also, you know, use, use the term home health might also uh, use the term non-medical care. And a lot of times home care is referred to in this way, but home care providers are starting to expand their service offerings, not quite all the way to home health, but really to kind of bridge uh, between that non-medical and medical space. So a lot of times it's, it's not accurate to call home care non-medical care. We also hear it called private duty. Uh, a lot of times that's in reference to the fact that it's private pay. We also hear companionship care for home care, which that's a big important part of home care and the benefit that it brings. Uh, but a lot of times, again, it's more than just the companionship care. We also sometimes hear it referred to as a sitter. I hear this especially in long-term care settings or in hospital settings. Uh, we hired a sitter to come in and, and be with this resident or this patient uh, because they need more supervision. Um, so sometimes you'll hear a sitter used in place of home care. Homemaker services, uh, some, um, sometimes it's referred to in this way, for instance, uh, with a Medicaid waiver. It might cover homemaker type services. Uh, but again, that's one part of the, of the services that home care can deliver. It's not the complete picture. Home care, of course, is another term that uh, frequently used the more correct term. And then finally, personal care services is another term that's frequently used. And that's more of that, that hands-on care. And again, it's a service that um, home care can provide. And, and home health can also provide assistance and support in terms of a bath aid, for example, uh, as a type of personal care service. So again, there's a lot of confusion around what to call it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, home health and home care uh, can be used or often, pardon me, are often used interchangeably, uh, but they are two separate services. And again, that terminology can be confusing. And while both services are complementary of one another and often used together, they are two separate, um, two separate types of service. And home care can often take over when a home health care benefit uh, expires or ends. Uh, and so these are things that, that family caregivers often get confused about. And sometimes it can be helpful to talk about home health and home care 
in the broader conversation of the senior care spectrum. So I know this is a lot to put on a screen, and uh, if your computer uh, laptop's as small as mine, it's kind of hard to read uh, everything on there, I apologize, but you can download the slides and, and read this in more detail later. But as you can see, um, home health and home care both fall within the senior care spectrum. Uh, there's so many options for the way people can age compared to when my great-grandmother uh, was aging. She really had one option, nursing home or uh, the family rallying around her to keep her at home. Uh, but now look at all the options that exist out there. Uh, so where home health and home care fall in this continuum um, might be a little confusing to families. So uh, on the bottom in the purple, you can see that home care is represented across uh, pretty much the entire spectrum. It can follow someone um, from that place of independence or maybe they just need a little bit of assistance, maybe some light housekeeping, a little meal preparation assistance, maybe uh, some transportation. Uh, but can it, it can follow the individual all the way through hospice at end of life. And home care can be provided in these other types of senior care um, offerings such as in assisted living or independent living or even in nursing homes or memory care when more one-on-one -on -one support is needed. And then home health care uh, is represented in green. Uh, that, bu that bubble could probably be a little bit bigger. It's trying to fit it all in there. Um, but while it can be also provided in a variety of settings such as in the independent or assisted living or in the home setting, um, there is a more limited amount of services that it can provide. It's more of a skilled need which requires a higher level of care. And so I'm going to go into detail uh, on these both types of care in just a bit, but again this just gives you a snapshot of the senior care spectrum and where these two types of services fall within uh, senior care. And I, I know that there's a lot of misconceptions out there about home health and home care. So I did want to touch on those just briefly here with you. So a lot of times uh, there's this misconception of home health is part of the healthcare continuum, but home care is not. And I really want to debunk this myth. Um, home care, especially in the past couple of years, has been um, recognized more so uh, as uh, an important service for helping older adults age in place, transition home, especially as healthcare systems are moving from a fee-for-service to more of a value-based care model. Uh, hospitals are seeing more value in having assistance at home. Also, with COVID-19, home care workers were deemed essential service providers, uh, and they were able to go uh, into the homes of seniors and continue their work despite the stay-at-home orders that were mandated in many states across the United States. So home care uh, is becoming part of the, the health care continuum. There's also uh, sometimes a misconception that home care is covered by Medicare, and at this point, uh, traditional Medicare does not cover home care services. However, some Medicare Advantage plans are exploring the options of adding home care as a covered service. Another misconception uh, involves cost. People often, if you look at uh, cost of care surveys that exist out there, uh, people often underestimate the cost of care at home, such as home care or home health care, and they overestimate the cost of facility care. So a lot of times professionals or even family caregivers assume that seniors and their family cannot afford home care uh, or services in the home. Uh, and they might not even offer it to the patient or, or the individual as an option. Uh, so I think uh, it's important to know that home care can be affordable for uh, a lot of people depending on their level of need and, and for the amount of care that is needed. Another misconception uh, is that home care might not be valuable to the health and wellness of an older adult. And in fact, it's the opposite. Really the goal of home care is to enhance the health and the well-being of the older adult. Uh, another misconception is home health visits uh, are for an extended period of time when in, in all actuality they're often for a limited amount of time and really to perform a specific task or uh, home care can be in the home for pretty much as long as the older adult needs the help and support. 
And then one final misconception is that home care only provides companionship or sitters. And I mentioned earlier uh, that home care agencies are really starting to expand their service offerings and can provide much more than just a sitter service. So again, hopefully this helped to debunk some of these myths and misconceptions that you or the people that you work with might have. So now I'm going to go into more detail on home health care. Uh, and many of you, this might be a review, uh, but again, when we're explaining the two types of services to families, I really just want to be clear on what the two types of services are. So home health uh, is required when there is a skilled or therapeutic need. Uh, an older adult wouldn't necessarily decide on their own maybe that they need health care. It would have to be a need uh, that is uh, requiring the use of home health. Uh, so it would have to have a doctor's order. Uh, the services that are provided are strictly task-based, uh, and they're delivered generally for just a limited period of time. A home health professional would, uh, for example, arrive, complete the task, uh, complete the necessary paperwork, and then leave. So frequently, or the frequency of those visits really depend on the need. But for example, uh, a, visit, a nurse might come in uh, a couple times a week, to, um, you know, for a wound dressing change or something of that sort. Um, so again, it's task-based and it's commonly for a limited period of time. And as I just mentioned, in order for the home health to start, it is necessary to be ordered by the healthcare provider. The provider would need to confirm that there is a need for a skilled uh, or therapeutic care and document uh, that there is a need in order for home health Start. And I'm going to go deeper uh, into the Medicare requirements for this uh, because the general uh, aging population is Medicare eligible uh, and home health care is generally covered by Medicare. Uh, and home health is also recommended for those who have trouble leaving the home without help. Uh, another common term for this would be homebound. I know they're trying to kind of get away from that term, but uh, it is uh, a term that is frequently used when talking about home health care. So let's look at the common service offerings for home health. So as you can see on the screen, uh, there are a variety of that skilled level of care that can be provided by home health. So, so for skilled nursing services, uh, these are services that are performed by or under the supervision supervision of a licensed or certified nurse to treat an injury or illness. A few examples of this could include uh, feeding tubes, catheter changes, observement, sorry, pardon me, observation or assessment of a condition, and wound care. Another type of service offered by home health is skilled therapy services. So speech, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, these services uh, that are reasonable and necessary for treating an illness or an injur injury might be ordered for home health. And they are per performed by or under the supervision of a licensed therapist. So home, uh, physical therapy at home could include gait training, uh, supervision of training for exercises to regain movement or strength in a certain body, uh, body area. A speech language pathologist could be ordered for home health uh, to include exercises that help regain and strengthen speech and language skills. And occupational therapy uh, could help with regaining the ability to do daily activities, such as eating or putting on clothes, enhancing the person's independence. A home health aid uh, might be involved in the home health care that an older adult receives. Uh, could include things like personal care services, such as helping with bathing, toileting, or dressing. Uh, but Medicare will not generally pay for the aid uh, just to do personal care. It would still have to also require a skilled need to also receive uh, this type of support. Medical social services might be ordered uh, by a healthcare provider, um, and this type of service can help with social and emotional concerns related to the illness and it might include counseling or help finding resources in the community. And again, uh, that's usually in addition to the skilled need that the individual has. They might also be able to provide certain medical supplies uh, that are covered by home health care, such as wound dressings or catheters, and also durable medical equipment might also be provided through home health. Medicare generally pays up to 80% 
of DME for certain types of medical equipment. Uh, it could be things like a wheelchair or a walker. So again, these are um, the service offerings. It doesn't mean that if a, a senior qualifies for home health care that they automatically qualify for all of these services. Again, it really goes back to the skilled or therapeutic need that they have, uh, and those are the services that generally are going to be covered. So I've talked a little bit about payment already, but let's talk more about how home health care is paid for. Uh, as I've mentioned, Medicare and Medicare Advantage under specific circumstances will cover um, home health services for those that are Medicare eligible. And I'm going to go over those uh, Medicare guidelines on the next slide here. Often home health uh, can also be covered by private insurance if the individual is not Medicare eligible. Medicaid might also cover home health services under specific circumstances. And if an individual wants to continue care beyond the coverage period that maybe Medicare or their insurance company provides, there could be an option to pay out of pocket when the coverage runs out. And then also, Veterans Affairs, the VA, um, may also cover the cost of home care under specific circumstances. So uh, the key here with all these payment options is that specific circumstance. It goes back to uh, that physician or healthcare provider uh, ordered uh, need for the skilled care in the home. So what are the Med Medicare guidelines? Uh, Medicare, uh, I feel like I've been in this space for years now, and Medicare is still so nuanced and confusing to me at times. I, I get the overall program, but sometimes their, their guidelines uh, are a little complex, and they are changing. Um, and so these are the current requirements for coverage for home health care. And since if you're working in the aging space, the majority of the individuals you're working with will likely be uh, covered by Medicare, I wanted to go over these guidelines. So they must again be, um, have a medically necessary uh, reason for this skilled or therapeutic care. There has to be that need. Uh, trouble leaving the home without help uh, or if leaving the home is not recommended due to their condition, that also is a requirement. They must see the healthcare provider face-to-face -to, -face to certify the need and receive documentation from the provider uh, confirming that homebound status and the skilled need. Uh, there's also a need to receive uh, care from a Medicare certified home health agency. Uh, so some agencies may provide home health services, but they might not be Medicare uh, certified. And so in order for Medicare to cover it, as you can imagine, uh, it would have to be provided by a Medicare certified home health agency. And then finally, uh, Medicare will uh, reimburse at a lower rate if they've not been admitted to the hospital prior to receiving home health care. So that uh, is just kind of a, a factor that's important to include because oftentimes um, an older adult will be qualified for home health care upon a transition home. And we're going to be talking about the benefits of that um, when Lenita takes over in just a little bit. So next, now that we have a, a understanding of what home health offers, we're going to transition to talking about home care. So I mentioned earlier there's all these different names that we can throw out there for these terms or that have been thrown out there or used uh, over time. And home care uh, is the term that, uh, for those of us who are in this industry, we prefer to use. And it, again, it can be confusing, but, but home care uh, does a good job of capturing what this service provides. So home care is personalized care that meets the needs of the individual. There's a lot more flexibility in the types of services that are provided through home care versus home health care. And I'm going to go into those services on the next slide. But home care can be provided wherever the individual calls home, whether it's in a home setting, in a facility setting, even uh, in a hospital or skilled, uh, skilled facility. It's commonly charged at an hourly rate and often has hourly minimums that are required. So unlike home health care that is really task-based, um, this type of care can be customized. Uh, it can be delivered 24-7 oftentimes, and the schedule can really be adapted to meet the needs of the individual. 
And again, we know that family caregivers often take on the majority of care and support for their aging loved ones, especially when they have a transition home from a hospital or rehab stay. Uh, and so home care can fill in the gaps, maybe if a family member has to work during the day or if they just need a break, uh, some respite from the caregiving situation. So let's talk a little bit more about home care and the services that are all provided. I mentioned earlier that home care providers are expanding their service offerings. I think back to when Home Instead started 25 years ago, uh, we really started as just companionship and, and home helper. About five to seven years ago, we expanded to add personal care and offered also specific training to our workforce on Alzheimer's and dementia care so we could provide even better support to those individuals. And now uh, we're expanding our service offering uh, within the last year to also include things like medication management and administration. And, and we really honed in over the last couple of years on that transitional care and support we're able to offer into the home. So really this industry has evolved from just companionship care uh, to far more than that. Uh, and so we offer things like personal care, so with assistance with anything hands-on, bathing, grooming, that medication management, transitional care, meal preparation. We know nutrition is such an important part uh, of keeping older adults well and healthy, especially on a transition home from a hospital stay. We can also help with things around the home, uh, incidental transportation. I mentioned oftentimes home care can specialize in Alzheimer's and dementia care and really offer memory support in the home setting. And then companionship, it's always an important part of home care. Uh, if we think back to home health care, I talked a lot about how it's a task-based service. Uh, the provider has to come in and out pretty quickly. They can't, they don't have a lot of extra time to stay and chat and really get to know the individual. Uh, whereas home care, uh, they can take that extra time and really build the relationship. And we know that can be so important for isolation and loneliness. Uh, that is certainly a concern for, for the aging population. So companionship is still a fundamental part of home care, but uh, the services offered by this industry has really grown over the years. But there are different types of home care providers. Um, so earlier I mentioned how home health has, uh, you know, Medicare certified home health agencies. Um, other agencies might provide home health services. Um, and so really there's, for that uh, type of care, um, it's pretty cut and dry. But for home care, there are different types of agencies and we, or types of providers, and we bucket them into three categories, agencies, registries, and independent home care workers. And so when we're talking with families and they're trying to decide on a home care provider, it's important to be able to explain these types of providers and the benefits uh, of each. But there's also um, some things that they need to be made aware of. So for agencies, uh, most home care agencies hire caregivers who are screened, trained, bond, bonded, and insured, and caregivers are employees of the agency. So the agency, they take on all of the staffing and employment issues such as taxes, workers' compensation, addressing performance issues, and continuing education for their employees. And the agency also provides uh, replacements uh, if the, um, the caregiver, the professional caregiver, is sick or goes out of town. Uh, and Home Instead is an example of an agency. Registries uh, are a little bit different. They will recruit independent home care contractors. Uh, they, they likely will screen them. That's not always the case. Uh, but they refer them to the consumer, who is typically the older adult or uh, an adult uh, child family caregiver. And then the, the uh, older adult becomes the employer and is responsible for all of the employment responsibilities, such as taxes and scheduling and performance issues. So the independent contractor uh, works on their own. They're not likely to have backup if he or she uh, is sick and cannot work. And independent co contractors, they may have training or they may not, and that continuing education may be part of something they pursue and may not. So again, uh, registries can sometimes be a little less expensive than an agency, uh, but as a reminder to the older adult, if they take on a little bit more of that responsibility uh, in the management and the, the employer uh, side of things. 
And then there's the independent home care worker. And that's those who market themselves and find their own clients. So it might be the neighbor next door. Uh, they might put an ad in the paper, something of that sort. Uh, they might, uh, their criminal background checks and references might come at the expense of the consumer, the older adult, and all employment issues, uh, the taxes, the insurance, workers' compensation, those all fall to the older adult. And there's generally also no replacement if that independent caregiver is sick. So again, uh, there are some benefits of, of having an independent caregiver. It could be uh, somebody that you know. Uh, it could come at a lower cost. But again, um, the older adult, the family, really take on the employer status. So we have the agency that fully employs the caregiver. Uh, the professional caregiver takes on all the employer employer responsibilities, the registries, uh, they might help to recruit uh, the independent home care worker and then uh, match them with the consumer and then the consumer takes on the responsibility of the employer. And then the independent care workers, they go out on their own and find their own consumers uh, and then the, the consumer takes on those employment responsibilities. So again, there's benefits to all, uh, but there's also some things to consider for all as well. And the big question we, I always get asked, and that comes up all the time, is payment. Uh, so what are the payment options for home care? I mentioned earlier that a lot of people, um, they overestimate the cost of home care, underestimate the cost of facility care, but they also a lot of times just assume that Medicare, Medicaid will cover home care. Um, however, um, that at this point is, is generally not the case. So the, the most common type of payment for home care is self-insurance, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, private pay or out-of-pocket. And that's the way the majority of home care is paid for currently. Long-term care insurance has also become an increasingly popular way to fund long-term care. Millions of Americans are covered under these policies. Uh, but these policies are written in a variety of ways to provide a variety of benefits. So it's really important for the older adult to understand what their particular policy covers. Uh, some policies cover home care services. Some of the older policies were written before home care was even really an option. Uh, however, you can sometimes um, work with the insurance carrier to modify the policy um, that would, that's a story for a whole other webinar, uh, but um, sometimes because home care can be a, a more afford affordable option, the long-term care insurance company will be willing uh, to work with the older adult to renegotiate the coverage. Uh, there are also new insurance policies that are being created, the combination of, of life insurance and long-term care insurance, so there are some options in that regard. A reverse mortgage is another way to pay for care. Uh, this is quite a controversial topic in the aging industry, but it is an option. Um, not everyone is for it, uh, but again, just when we're talking about options for payment, it, it is one to bring up. I mentioned earlier that some Medicare Advantage plans are starting to cover home care, but it's really important to check with the provider uh, to learn all about the benefits. For those who are Medicaid eligible, they might also qualify for a Medicaid waiver that could cover certain types of home care services. And then also the Veterans Assistance, the VA, uh, they might have um, coverage for home care under specific circumstances. So it's important to check with the VA. Um, and there are companies out there that will help um, older adults seek out the types of benefits that they might qualify for with Veterans Assistance. And then finally, grants. Um, some, especially in the Alzheimer's and dementia space, uh, there are home care grants. Um, home Instead partners with Hilarity for Charity, HSC, uh, to provide grants for in-home care for those caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's and dementia. And sometimes local Alzheimer's associations uh, will also have grants available. So that is an over overview of home care. So we've learned about home health, we've learned about home care, and um, they really, both services are, again, complementary of one another, but they are two separate services. And I think one of the uh, greatest areas of opportunity uh, to, is to really support an older adult when they transition home. Uh, having that extra support at home can really be um, 
key in their successful transition. So I'm going to stop there and let Lanita uh, take over uh, and talk more about that. Thank you, Lakeland, and hello again to everyone. As you already know, a successful transition is imperative to the health and safety of those being discharged. And as Lakeland stated, we look at both services, home care and home health care, as complementary to each other. And that starts with the discharge plan, which is coordinated with all of those involved with the care of the older adult. That includes not only the services that are taking them home, but the hospital discharge staff, the physician, the family, and of course the older adult who needs the care. Creating a plan with not only medical goals, but also their own personal goals will help set the stage for that success. So let's discuss some areas that impact transitioning home, no matter what service that you use. The first, the most important one I think at the top is the medication management and administration and ensuring that the medication is reconciled, that not only that everyone involved understands what those medications are and how to administer them, but that they're also there and available when they arrive home. Another important piece may be using an organization system that works for all involved, which could mean a, management, a medication management system or a service. Secondly, ensuring that your patient or your client has access to the follow-up with the healthcare provider post-discharge. This may mean making certain there are, is transportation available, or maybe they need someone to attend with them. It's equally important that there is an ability to attend and understand any additional therapy sessions that are ordered at discharge along with that. Number three is making sure the home is ready for the older adult to return home, which includes ensuring there's nutritious food available to maintain a healthy diet, and it may be making sure that older food is discarded. It's also important to discuss with the clinical staff or the physician the specific warning signs that everyone should be monitoring post-discharge, and these should also be added to that care plan. This may involve taking certain vital signs or watching for symptoms that may signal issues or complications, and you would always want those caring for that older adult to be aware of these in order to contact the healthcare provider before those warning signs become more serious. And then, of course, keeping track of the progress with all involved is a key driver in the success of transitioning home. Next, let's discuss some of the health-related tasks that may be needed as someone returns home. Those items listed on the slide are also tasks that may be involved with returning home, but of course each one will need a discharge plan that the team works on to design, and it needs to be a personalized plan of care. Some things you may see um, in a transition of care is um, they may have need for dressing changes. They may need vital signs monitored more frequently. It may be involved with medical equipment or they just maybe some personal care services. Everyone, whether it's home health or home care, could be involved in each of these healthcare related tasks. I believe though at this point it's important to understand that what can certain tasks must be done by nursing personnel and some things can be delegated in either home care or in home health care services. Many home care companies, as Lakeland indicated, have added nurse delegated services to further assist their clients in their home. And what is important to remember and understand is that these services are, that are called skilled um, in many cases are those that a nurse cannot delegate and involve using clinical judgment and assessment, which would differentiate between your home health services and your home care services. However, it's important to note that home health aides and caregivers in most cases can be taught to assist in tasks such as vital signs and medication administration when appropriately delegated by the nurse who has oversight for the care. Let's talk a little bit about medication management. For the most part, both home care and home health care can participate in medication 
Management Administration. Again, there are aspects only a nurse can do, and those that can be done by a caregiver with RN oversight and delegation. And as we review this slide, we can see that each bullet point listed here would be important for everyone involved to understand. Anyone can pick up a prescription and anyone can make sure that it gets ordered when it's appropriate for refills. The understanding all the medication labels and instructions is important for anyone involved in the care. The ability to administer the correct medication at the right time and monitor for side effects. Of course, storing medication properly and safely and maintaining that schedule. And of course, if something's just uh, no longer needed, you would want to dispose of that medication appropriately. And it's always helpful and beneficial to use a medication tracking system to record all the medications. So next, let's talk a little bit about family communication. For both services, as we transition someone home, it's important to have frequent and consistent communication with the client and their families involved in the care. With home health, they work to ensure instructions and training is provided to family and others caring for the older adult. And it's important to have re a reinforcement of the care plan along with additional support and education of their health needs. It's also essential to be aware of where important documents are kept. And in some cases, it may be important to assist them in paying bills or maybe sorting the mail. Some other important items is household management. Those duties um, can be important for either home health or home care staff. We see it more probably in the home care staff arena. But in order to transition home appropriately, you need to make sure that you're ensuring a safe environment. And then to do that, you would want to complete frequent home safety checks. And as we mentioned earlier, checking the refrigerator for outdated and spoiled foods before discharge. And then supplying appropriate foods, again, before discharge. You would want to prepare the appropriate meals based on the healthcare provider's guidance, and that can include low sodium or additional um, prescribed diets. Prior to discharge, you may want to shop for everything that is needed upon the return for home. Managing the schedule and communication with the healthcare providers that are visiting the home to ensure that you have appropriate coverage. Arranging for deliveries and medical supplies and equipment all of these working in conjunction to make sure that everything that they need is in the home and ready for use. And next, we'll talk a little bit about social engagement. As in any home situation for older adults, social engagement is very important to recovery. And sometimes it's what's forgotten. Whatever we can do to reduce isolation and loneliness becomes very important on their road to recovery. It may be offering technology to stay connected or facilitating activities outside the home, along with providing meaningful activities in, inside the home. And then, of course, person-centered approach to the memory care based on the Alzheimer's and dementia training is imperative for those struggling with cognitive issues. Finally, I want to discuss some questions that are important to ask before selecting the company you use. And some of these um, Lakeland's gone over previously, but I, I think they're well worth mentioning again. Is this an agency employee or is this a contracted employee or is the provider working on his or her own? That's an important question to ask and then a question thing to determine before you hire a service. Has this care provider passed criminal background checks? You would, of course, want that to be a yes. Are they bonded and insured? Has each staff member been appropriately trained for work in the home? What was that training? Do you have access to ongoing training as you work in the home? Was there specific training for Alzheimer's and other dementia? 
And what about backup if the care provider gets sick or needs a day off? Are, is that something that is supplied? Continuing on, what restrictions apply to the services that you're requesting? There may be regulations by state or by the services if you're using Medicaid or a managed care of any type, such as Medicare Advantage, they may have certain regulations and requirements also. How much flexibility is there in the scheduling on the service that you're choosing? How much notice would you need to begin or cancel services? What is the cost and the payment options, or are there payment options? If this is a home health care agency, is it Medicare certified? And then finally, what is their quality assurance program? And what, what information can you get in regards to that? All very important questions to ask, no matter what type of service that you're having come into your home, to ensure that you have safety for that older adult. And now I'll transition back to Lakeland to finish up. Thank you so much, Lanita. Uh, and we have some great questions coming in. And, and one of them was, you know, what, what kind of questions should families be asking related to COVID? And so since we're, we were just talking about questions to ask home health and home care, I thought I'd address that quick before I go over resources. Uh, so when you're working, um, when you're looking at hiring uh, an in-home care provider or looking to have home health come in into the home, uh, it's important to ask what precautions they t do they take uh, in, in the protection or the reduction of risk of COVID-19. A lot of times when you're setting up these types of services, home health or home care, there's an initial kind of consultation or an intake process that's typically done in person. So does this uh, organization uh, offer that maybe in a virtual format? A lot of, I know our home and sit offices are doing virtual care consultations or uh, doing more Q&A over the phone as opposed to in person before they come to the home for the first time. Um, you know, what are the types of PPE, the personal protection equipment, do these individuals wear when they go into the home? So those are some good questions to ask. Uh, these these providers in light of COVID-19. Uh, we had to put this presentation together a few months ago, and uh, so I didn't have a chance to add those COVID questions, but uh, I really appreciate whoever asked that question, and, and we hope that those are helpful. So you probably had a chance to glance at some of these resources here uh, on the slide. Um, you know, there, all of these resources are great. Uh, there's a, a guide that I helped put together you can download for free on navigating long-term care insurance. Um, you, there's also, um, there's so many complexities to Medicare. There's a great organization called Medicare Rights Center. Uh, their, their website is medicarerights.org. They can help uh, families, professionals navigate Medicare and answer uh, some of those commonly asked questions. Uh, if you're working with a veteran, there's veterans assistance. Uh, sometimes hiring a, a geriatric care manager can be helpful, so I've listed that website there, aginglifecare.org. Uh, Home Instead has some great resources, caregiverstress.com. Uh, we have an entire guide on returning home, so helping with that transition. Uh, uh, home care resources at homeinstead.com. Uh, the Home Care Association of America is also a good resource. Um, and I have listed their website there and also the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. Um, someone also had asked a question about, uh, you know, how can uh, home care provide medication administration in the state of Colorado? Uh, you know, uh, here you have to be a licensed home health agency to do that. And, and what I failed to mention when I talked about home care is um, home care is not regulated quite like home health care is. So each state regulates home care, and some states don't have home care regulations at all. So uh, it's important to ask what services can be offered and what cannot, because in each state it might differ um, as to what home care can be, what kind of services home care can offer. So um, again, these are some great resources. I saw someone else ask about uh, the, that grant that I mentioned. Um, there's 
this website at the bottom of this slide, helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. If you visit that website, uh, it will direct you to um, where you can apply for that grant. And the grant was Hilarity for Charity, HFC. Uh, and so uh, you, can, you can find that information there. So thank you for those questions. Uh, and now Lenita and I are going to take some more questions. There's so many good ones coming in. So we really thank you uh, for all of the questions um, that, that you submitted so far. Um, so let's see, some of the questions here. So somebody asked about home care registry. So we talked a little bit about that. Uh, so home care registries, I know uh, in local communities, there might be organizations that serve as a home care registry. Uh, but what also is becoming popular is kind of like the Uber of caregiving apps uh, that exist out there um, that you can kind of hire a caregiver through an app. Uh, and so that would be um, considered a registry. Uh, Lenita, do you have anything else to add when it comes to registries? Uh, no, I, I mean, that's the piece of the registries. That's where you would find them. I, I think the important piece on the registry is those questions that we made it at the end. Um, if I was going to use a registry, I'd want to know what's the backup plan if they need to, um, if they need a day off, if they're ill. I want to know um, about are they bonded and insured um, through the registry or privately? Um, items like that that you would see with a, if you hired a, uh, an agency versus whether you hired a registry or a personal uh, person on their own. Thanks. Do you have something else to add, Bonita? No, that was it. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is the average out-of-pocket cost for home care? And I would say that it really varies based uh, on where you're located. So uh, the cost in a urban setting might be higher than a more rural setting. There are, uh, Genworth does a great cost of care study. So if you go out there and just Google Genworth cost of care study, you can go in and even type in your zip code to see the average cost. So for home care, uh, it could really range anywhere from $17 an hour to $30 an hour based on the need of the individual. Uh, so I wish I could give you a more concrete answer to that, um, but it really does vary uh, based on where you are and based on the type of home care uh, provider that you are working with. And somebody asked, what's your most common Oh, go ahead, Lenita. No, I was just going to ask. Um, there's two questions on Medicare Advantage. Um, would you like me to answer? Would you like me to address those? Sure. So one question was, can you talk about the ability of Medicare Advantage plans to pay for home care and when that will be available? What we can tell you is there are a handful of plans that are providing some in-home care services, they call, they refer to them as in-home supports. But the, the issue with uh, Medicare Advantage is the plans can choose to add a home care benefit or not. And not a lot of them have embraced it yet, and each one is different depending on the plan. So you would, it'd be really important to, to understand the plan, that, that policy that that person has really well, um, and to read it over very clearly um, before beginning services or before requesting services on that. Um, the other question on Medicare is, does Medicare pay for any services um, in the home? How does Medicare pay for any services um, as far as home care? And traditional Medicare does not. It's only that Medicare Advantage plan that can pay for them. And again, that was only a choice made by each individual Medicare Advantage plan. Thanks, Lakeland. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, there was also a question about um, having home health or home care providers in facility settings, especially with COVID-19. Uh, we're seeing, uh, just from the home care side of things, that um, a lot of, I would say, a good number of facilities are still allowing 
home health or home care into the facility. Um, somebody had asked, you know, do they have the right to refuse those services? Uh, and it really comes down to the individual facility and their policy. Uh, a lot of, I was talking with some individuals in home health recently, and, and they've also kind of adapted their service model. Some, some of the physical therapists are trying, you know, to virtually um, provide services maybe one day a week and, and going into the home or the facility two days a week instead of, you know, going face-to-face uh, -face every single time just to uh, help uh, reduce risks of any exposure. So that's why it's really important to, you know, ask the provider that you're working with, what precautions are you taking? Uh, if you are working with someone in a facility setting, uh, what are their um, policies around having outside services in? But from, from what we're hearing out in the field, there are uh, a lot of facilities that are still allowing in home health and home care. But again, it is pretty situational. Lenita, were any of the other questions jumping out at you? Um, I'm not jump. No, I wouldn't say jumping out at me. I know that there's um, a question, and one of the questions that you might want to answer is, what is the difference between our um, us, which would be home instead, I'm assuming, and and not someone like care.com or honor.org? Are you pulling from the same resource pool? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I can really only speak for home instead. Uh, we hire all of our uh, caregivers as employees. So we have, we're W2'd with all of our employees. So we handle all of the employment. So a care.com, uh, that would be what I would consider a registry. So they are uh, pooling people who want to provide home care uh, and then connecting them with that end consumer. Um, and then Honor, um, you, might, you might be a little more familiar with that, but uh, they, they are providing home care services. Um, and Linda, do you know if they are, are W2 employed or if they're, they're more of a contracted both. model? They okay, may be both, yeah, both. It depends on where they're at. Um, I think Honor is working on switching to W-2s, but not necessarily all of them are yet. Okay. So that's why those, that, those couple slides of questions that, that Lenita went over are really important uh, to pass along to families because uh, they might not know to ask those questions. So as professionals in the field, uh, that's where we can provide, uh, you know, that list of questions that they should be asking. So, so thank you. That's, that's, that is a great question. And, and we've seen the number of, of home care providers and home health providers really grow over the years. Um, and so there are a lot of options out there, uh, which, which is great for the end consumer, but it can also be really confusing and overwhelming. And I know um, a lot of times, you know, in a hospital setting or uh, as part of a discharge plan, a family might be handed a list of home care providers. Uh, and they're just in alphabetical order. And it can be very overwhelming uh, for a family to go out and research all of those. So uh, as a professional, I know a lot of hospital systems, uh, they, uh, they don't allow their employees to, you know, star a couple of the, the places on the list. Uh, but if you can, you can, as a professional, vet the organizations that are providing care in your community and you know ones that are, are reliable, um, being able to pass that information on to the consumer can really help them uh, in that research process. Because we know that oftentimes uh, families really only uh, look for services in a, in a crisis moment. Uh, we, rare, we rarely get people who are planning, you know, a year, six months down the road for maybe when they need care and support in the home. It's usually happening in a crisis situation. So um, we, we want to be able to, you know, help them make the best decision they can uh, for the types of care that they need and the services and support that they need. Uh, and so by having things like a list of resources and a list of questions that they can ask in their vetting process can be really helpful. So um, I just want to thank all of you so much for joining us today. There were some great questions that we didn't get to. Uh, I apologize, but feel free to reach out to me, um, Lenita, if you have any further questions. Uh, and thank you for all of the care and support you're providing older adults, uh, especially during this, this pandemic where, um, you know, having care and support at home might be um, a little intimidating, uh, but 
there are home care providers and home health care providers out there that are taking precautions and, and doing all that they can to reduce the risk of exposure uh, to the seniors that they're working with and to protect the, the, the employees that they have hired. So uh, I want to thank you and thank Lanita for joining me today and uh, thank everyone at ASA for, for hosting us. Great. Thank you so much, Lakeland and Lanita, for being here with us today. That was a really great presentation. If you would Thank like you. to Have claim day, everyone. if you would like to claim CUs for today's webinar, you'll be receiving a follow up email by the end of the business day that will contain a link to the CEU application. That follow up email will also contain a link to download today's slides. Please note that you have sixty days to claim your CEUs and it will take 30 days from the date of your submission in order for us to process and issue your CEUs. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great day.